Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dave Chalmers, Chief Commercial Officer at LMN. We have an incredible guest speaker with us today. And just before I have the honor of introducing Nathan, uh, wanted to talk about two housekeeping items before we get uh, underway. First, if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, please use your chat window in the GoToWebinar and we will facilitate those um, as they come in. Second, for today's webinar, everyone in attendance will receive a recording uh, by email as well as all of the documents and additional resources that uh, Nathan has so graciously put together and is offering up as part of this webinar in order to help drive additional value um, in your business. So there's some incredible resources that, that he'll talk about along the way. So as we begin, welcome Nathan Helder. Uh, Nathan is the president of Gelderman Landscape Services and also the founder of Southbrook Consulting. Uh, Nathan took over the position of president and owner at Gelderman from his father-in-law, Hank Gelderman, back in 2007. And since that time, Nathan has helped Gelderman do over double revenues, as well as grow his team uh, to quite a significant size. Um, in order to achieve these results, Nathan has made a, a number of significant changes um, in order to drive this success, including instituting a corporate structure, implementing a strategic planning cycle, obviously uh, developing as a, as a byproduct of, of education, um, a Gelderman University training program for all of his crews, an incentive plan that rewards, you know, and uh, steers the, the right uh, behaviors so that uh, the results are easily achieved, um, and expanding his business by opening up a number of new branches. Um, now, Nathan, as a founder and principal consultant at Southbrook Consulting, he is in the uh, fortunate position of being able to work with many organizations across the country, um, coaching, advising, and helping them with their business numbers. So, Nathan, Thank you so much for your time. We know that you're running an extremely busy schedule these days. Um, really looking forward to learning from you and hearing more about how do we get back to business uh, given COVID and everything else that everybody is, is managing uh, in the landscape industry right across North America. So Nathan, over to you. Welcome again. All right, well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave, for the... Uh... Uh, gracious introduction. I'm not sure if I could. Uh, it's probably better than what I would say. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I'm I'm not your typical landscape uh, owner uh, in that I didn't start my career in the landscape world. I actually started in the in the cow business. Um, yes. Uh, so I, I'm a University of Guelph graduate. Animal science was my major. I spent 10 years advising dairy farmers on how to feed their cows. Um, but I got the unique opportunity of taking over a 50 year old business. Uh, a landscape business, uh, which was my father-in-law's business. Uh, however, my wife had never worked for her father ever. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I quit my job on a Friday uh, with a fee company and joined Gellerman on a Monday. And that was in 2006 and the rest is history. Um, and so, uh, yeah, thanks uh, Dave for introducing, introducing Southbrook Consulting. I guess the word that came all about was um, along the, my journey, I, I've realized over the years that um, to do beautiful work is is fantastic. However, at the end of the day, uh, we hope to have something left over. And so it it, it bothered me a, a lot that a lot of landscape companies and, and entrepreneurs uh, had great businesses, uh, great products, services, but they were they had a job, and that's pretty much all they had, and they were not making money. Um, plus, you know, they were they were a bad competitor to Gelderman because. They would do as good as work as Gelderman, but their prices were 30% less. And that was problematic for me in my landscape business. So I thought of if we could 
uh, educate the world around us, uh, they can make more money and we can all win together. And that's how Self Growth Consulting came about about five years ago. Uh, last year, I decided to pull my irrigation services out of Gelderman. I actually joined another uh, fellow and we, we created a new company together. That's the uh, irrigation company that's totally separate from Gelderman. Um, I'm not the president, I'm the vice president, uh, silent uh, partner almost. Um, and we've, you know, we've, we, so we have that business as well, an irrigation business that's totally separate from our, our landscape business. So that's been going quite well. Um, and everything is going quite well. Um, you know, this past year, uh, you think of January, February, you know, we hear about things happening overseas, but think, ah, you know, we're, we're re resilient. We're, you know, we're isolated from China and, and everywhere else. Um, but then, of course, in, in March, when it all hit, around that March break, the COVID hit. And so today's session is really about walking down the path that I took at, at Gelderman, all the different changes we have, because I, I have a really unique opportunity here is that I could be a consultant and I advise and coach other landscape companies and other contracting businesses, home renovations as well. But at the same time, I'm living and breathing uh, all the issues that you have in your business, because I have two other, I have a irrigation business and I have a landscape business. So um, I'm gonna share with you what I did uh, early on, uh, back in March, around the March break or so, and decided to be pretty decisive. Uh, it was not easy, um, but I'm very thankful that I, I was decisive as much as I was. And so, you know, as your, you know, your reaction to COVID is, can be so much, right? And so, you know, I've seen so many different reactions with people. And I know myself, my emotions are gone up and down as well. Um, the only emotion I did not have was just put my head, uh, you know, over, my hands over my head and say, well, I'll just hold my breath and we'll sink or swim. Um, I did not do that. Uh, whereas a lot of my peers in the industry said, well, this will be over in four weeks and let's see what happens. Um, and we don't, you know, we all know what's happened. It hasn't ended yet. Um, and whether COVID actually will ever end, who knows, right? Um, there's so much uh, rhetoric and ideas and stuff like that. But as your owners, your company, um, is what's your reaction with COVID? How are you? How have you responded? Uh, hopefully, it's not like the uh, the people that were running this ship uh, a bunch of years ago. And so the, the key for me is really understanding is um, is where do we need to be? Right, so I think of Wayne Gretzky, you know, I'm a, I'm a Canadian, um, so hockey is near and dear to uh, us. And so, you know, Wayne Gretzky says the best, to figure out how you can skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. And that's where it's so hard. We have a moving target. We don't know where we're heading in, in, a, in a sense. We don't know how long this is going to last. Um, yet we know we need to be somewhere different than we were in the past, right? So this is where I, I'm always looking forward uh, several months, several, um, you know, a year in advance trying to figure out where, where, where do I need to uh, aim or head towards for my landscape business? And so, you know, the response to COVID, is, I just came across this quote, and this is where I, I live this quote, is what's more important than anything you do is everything you do. So be very intentional. Today, it's even more so. You can't just dabble in things. Oh, let's try this, try that. No, no, it's anything you do, you have to do the very best and you have to make hay when you can. Uh, we, we live in a, a, a geography, especially in Ontario here, where you know summer is only eight months and winter is four months. Um, and so you don't have nine months to do landscaping. You actually have eight. It's not like the South where it could be 10 or 12 months. And so we have to be very intentional. And with all that's happened in Ontario is that, um, you know, part of our industry was shut down for the month of April. And so now our run, runway has gotten that much shorter. So we have to be even more intentional on how we do things. And so the session today is, is divided up into basically two parts. And the first part is really about, talks about a solid foundation. And the funny thing is, you know, when I put this PowerPoint together, it's like this, this, this presentation should be, can be done any time of the year or any time of, uh, you know, last year, or the year before, or whatever. Uh, what I'm going to speak about is nothing to do with COVID, really. It's all a good business sense, whether it's for a recession, recession proofing your company or um, operating uh, always like this. Right. So what you're going to hear is not rocket science. It's things that I have done in my business and gone back to my business and how I advise uh, my clients on the consulting side. Um, and the big question that I'm asking right now to everybody is, it's why did you start your business? And it's a simple question, but the reason why I ask is, 
because in the midst of stress, like I'm talking to my staff today, everybody is wired, uh, amped up, everybody's in angst. We don't know what's going on. There's so many things going on in this world that causes concern, and yet many of us have no control of all those things. And so we tend to lose sight of why we are in business. You know, why did you start your business? And going back to that motivation of what caused you to, to really give her, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, especially in today uh, where, you know, you're getting pulled and stretched for all over the place is if you, if you lose that ability to see, you know, why did you start? Uh, you will give up far easier. All right. So I just asked that question, ask yourself, why did you start your business? And many people will say, well, to make better money. Well, I, I'll tell you right now, uh, that's the result of being in business. Hopefully, if that's your why, uh, you may be really uh, demotivated by that because we might be going through a, a great time or we might have a good time and a bad time later. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the why in a second. But you know, why did you start your business is a question to, to keep in mind. And then as you move forward now, so you know, Gelderman has been doing strategic planning for a number of years. We had created one before our fiscal start date, which was April the 1st. Well, guess what? We've had to rip up that strategic plan, start over. Uh, the, the, the game's changed. The rules are different. Uh, the environment's different. Uh, our staffing issues are different. And so which, where are we going now? And so it was important for, for me and my team to really, um, you know, we were meeting uh, daily back in March uh, when all this uh, opened up. And so, okay, how do we adjust? How do we change? What do we need to do? What do we need to focus on? Um, in my case, uh, when I when I, we heard what was going on, I ended up laying 50 people off all in one day. And people said to me, you're crazy, Nathan. Like, this might be over in two, three weeks. And I said, that's fantastic. Then we'll call them right back. Um, but we did lay off 50 people. Um, and, you know, we started working remotely. My admin team still is working remotely. It's working okay. Uh, there's some things that work very well. Productivity has actually improved, but culturally, people are now isolated and they can't rely on their team members to for that little extra guidance or that little extra talking to. And especially when this COVID thing just keeps going. Now in Canada, it's probably different in the states, but in Canada, each province is different from each other. I think the states are similar. Every state operates differently from each other, and so there's a lot of pressure from from COVID, which is stressing people out. You know, so in your strategy and your planning, it's like, okay, how do we handle all this and how do we move forward? When you look at your strategy as well and, and you know, what's your compass look like? You know, where are you heading or, and what are you going to focus on? Because in our landscape world, there's, you know, you can say, well, we're going to focus on everything. Well, we all know that if you try to focus on, you know, you're going to be the best quality, the highest service, you're going to be the most efficient, you're going to be highly innovative, the best price. I'm going to suggest that if you try to focus on all four or five of those things, you're going to get everything kind of mediocre. Like you're not going to do very well. Um, so we need to really focus on what's the one or two things and keep it for that. If you're going to focus on quality, still be that high quality. If it's going to be about creating great service um, and good communication, then do that. Uh, it's about being efficient. Sometimes we know if we be really highly efficient, do we sacrifice on quality? And now is a really a, a, an important time to reevaluate with your own company your own clients and say, okay, just because we've always done it that way up until March, do we keep doing it that way or do we make adjustments now? And I'm suggesting is we have to make the adjustments. A, 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 a crisis like this is a terrible thing to waste. I know for myself, uh, we've made adjustments on the fly really fast. We consolidated one branch. Uh, we, were, we, we changed some people around. Uh, that leads us to my next slide here is about the team. Right. Is that team exhibiting your core values? Um, you know, when you have some members on your team that are actually, um, you know, maybe not in the right position or right seat on the bus uh, pre-COVID. And, and pre-COVID, I found that um, sales covers a lot of sins. There's a lot of things happening in my company that uh, until the sales start to drop off, all of a sudden you start seeing all these red flags and think, wow, when did that happen? Or how did that get to that point? And with COVID now, and with an, as an opportunity, we have the uh, chance now to make some hard changes. Some people have not been returned to work because I have not wanted to take them back, and we're still hiring. So it's really about trying to find good people. I believe right now is a great time to hire. Uh, there's some great people from other industries that have the right traits for our business, uh, and it's now the time to pick them up. 
Uh, whereas some of the people that have a lot of experience actually don't have the tenacity, the go power, and now we need the go power more than ever. Right, so it's really about you're looking at your team. Do they get it? Do they want the job? Do they have the capacity to do it? Some people say, oh yeah, I'd like to do it, but they actually get emotionally drained and they have these you know, uh, emotional outbursts. Well, they likely don't have the capacity to do the role. And do they have it? We know as business owners, we say people, we need people to have it. And sometimes we have a hard time explaining what it is. And so I sort of sum up it as having that grit, the tenacity, that go power, that building people up and yet be a humble spirited person. You know, they have it that is worth a, a ton and that makes a huge difference for your company. And it, especially in this time now when there's so much noise out there, like, like if you're on Twitter or Instagram and, and Fox News and CNN, like give your head a shake, man. You're going to you're gonna lose confidence real fast. And so as a business leader, is is our position, our job, our focus to restore confidence in our company and communicate often. And lo and behold, this doesn't cost any money. You know, this is the cheapest thing you can do. And for me, for my company at Gelderman here, so we've been doing uh, a weekly Zoom meeting. It's a 10 o'clock, it's 15 minutes. It's basically a weekly town hall, an update. And my, the reason why we're doing this is trying to, trying to pull everybody to get together, but also is to restore the confidence that all the staff that were, um, didn't want to work due to COVID are back because we are operating safely and we've been communicating often, explaining how we're doing things, and not just you know, letting them figure this out on their own. Because we all know when staff have to figure things on their own, they're gonna do it their own way, um, or they'll do it the wrong way, and then you're gonna get terribly frustrated with how they do things. Um, and so it's important this time now than and ever is that you connect the dots for them. You should show them how to be successful. What does that role look like, and how does it be super successful? Because our runway got shorter. April, we couldn't do a lot of work. Um, and there's a high expectation. Plus, a lot of areas are talking about leads coming in like crazy, right? So in Ontario right now, uh, there's a lot of people working from home. There's a lot of people not working still. If you actually wanted to put a pool in, a pop-up pool from uh, Walmart, uh, you couldn't find one. If you wanted to buy a tomato plant, it's gonna cost you uh, probably 20 bucks. If you wanna buy a chicken, a laying chicken for your few chickens out back cost you $60 a chicken. So everybody's sitting at home. And the other part, which is good and bad, but the other part is that they want us, because they're at home, they want landscaping now. So the re residential market for, for us here in Ontario is, is going crazy. People are asking like for leads and quotes and things like never before, right? So we're gonna hire people. We're gonna say sink or swim, get on the crew, away you go. Or is there a different way? And connecting the dots is going to be very important. Is onboarding your staff is going to be critical. So we look at, you know, back to 2020, looking forward, we have to rethink your why. Why should somebody work for you? Uh, why are you in business? I right? asked that question earlier. And I think of, you know, your why is in the past could be different of now, right? You've realized that spending time with your family is actually not so bad. And so if you think of the why of your own business, you know, what is it? Right, so if you look, think of Disney is bring brings joy. Now Disney's been hit extremely hard through all of this, right? So uh, you think of Apple's think different. Steve Jobs was all about you know creating new and, and, and new innovations. Um, Element is to build a better business. Uh, Geldman is caring is our nature, right? So what is your why for your company, and is it time now to make adjustments to it or to improve it? You know. To say that we're just going to go back to the old ways, um, I think it would be false. You know, I, I think it, it won't be like that. Combined with your why is also your core values. And here is where you're know, thinking, okay, we're just going to work hard, keep going, go, go, go. But at the end of the day, um, your team is going to do the work for all of our companies. It's important that we have the team members that actually embody our core values. And so for Gelderman, these are the four that we've had forever, uh, passion, respect, caring, integrity. But when my coach asked me, Nathan, what did you end up doing the last three months? I said, well, I, I adjusted, I, I, was a, uh, I was agile, I would I'd pivot, we changed this, we added that. Uh, he goes, yeah, your core values talk, sound like a 65-year-old company that's been just doing the same thing for a long time. I'm like, you're right, there's a core value that's missing. And so next week we'll be talking about what core value 
have we shown in the last three months that is not listed? And it's the core value of agility or to be agile or to be adaptive. If you're not agile in the last three months, uh, <laughs> you're hurting pretty bad. Um, and you think of those restaurant company restaurants doing more takeout and more uh, drive-by pickups and stuff. The ones that are just holding their breath and thought they could wait it out are pretty much out of business, right? So the, the concept or the core value of being agile or to, to show agility, uh, I see it in my own staff. Some have it, some don't. The ones that don't are struggling big time, and I'm not sure if they're going to make it, right? So that's the core value that we're, we are going to likely add to our uh, group of four. Maybe we're going to change it. Maybe we'll have a fifth one. Maybe we'll reevaluate the other four. But this is where you have to look at your own company and say, okay, what are my core values? Oh, maybe I don't have any. Time to think about it because your core values is your, your foundation, your ethics, is how you how you behave as you move forward. And you know, this is tough as leaders, right? And you think, well, I don't know how to be the leader I need to be. You know, and everybody says I should be authentic, whatever that means. Well, that's just true to yourself. Who are who are you? Right. And I always look at this as saying, be the kind of leader that you would follow. Right. Uh, we've all had bosses that we've not liked and we have liked. Uh, we've all been, uh, you know, had different leaders and leadership styles. But be be the kind of leader that you would want to follow. Right. So as we sort of sum it up, we think of what's post COVID. You know, I talked really on the business side of things, on strategy and, and where we're heading. But post COVID, and I'm not sure if I can even say that yet, this is post COVID, or this is going to be life with COVID, as be a better way of saying it, is that every hour will count even more, right? There's, we have less time to do anything. Uh, we've learned that flexible work environments can work. In my case here, we are we can all work remote, payroll remote, everything. Uh, and it works can work quite well. I don't think we're ever going to add more office spaces to our building here. We'll just do flex work environments and people love it. They can work from home. Um, I think of the service industries, right? It's certain service industries, you know, whatever is deemed essential, and that's a whole nother topic. Uh, but the grass always grows, the snow always flies, right? That that business will always continue. Um, the residential market, the landscape design build, it's up and down depending on uh, recessions and and you know money availability and stuff like that. But post post COVID. We know now than ever, more than ever, that we need to focus on productivity and efficiency. Uh, we've seen a greater appreciate for safe, for safety. Like, you know, for many years we've been uh, promoting safety and trying to get our staff to embrace it, embody it, and it's been tough. Whereas today, uh, they all come to uh, to work with their own masks. We did not even have to really provide them. We do have them here for them, and safety is like number one now. All of a sudden, so that's that's positive. Um, and also consumer behaviors are changing too, uh, purchasing behaviors and expectations. With everybody sitting at home uh, or working from home, guess what? If you're in this maintenance business, they're watching you like a hawk now as you cut their grass and take care of the gardens. And when you don't do a good job, uh, they see it right away. They also see when you do a good job, we've had both sides, lots of testimonials and, and happy clients, but also they're seeing every little thing that we've missed as well. And so post COVID, uh, I think we, there's a higher expectation for business that so we have to perform at a higher level. So how how do we how, how do we end up doing that? That's you know that that's the key. So that's where my second part is is how do we excel, right? How do we excel through all this? And the and the first thing is this flame. This flame to me um, makes me think of a story um, of when I first started in the Gelderman. So when I first arrived on the scene at Gelderman, uh, I was a son-in-law, no landscape experience. Um, I was a young guy, and I was, gonna, I'm, I was 32 years old. Uh, we had 50 staff, around 5 million sales, and I was going to take this company to the next level. So I was a third generation. And so I sold my condo, um, $100,000 uh, free money, and I was going to buy this business. Well, I didn't, I didn't have a lot to put down, so I put the $100,000 down. My father-in-law uh, took, basically, uh, he became the Bank of Hank. His first name is Hank. And so, to me, the numbers have been everything because I had no money come into this. I took over this large company and I was indebted for a long time. And so, I've, the flame has been real close to my rear, and it and it has been for many years. Uh, and now again, it's gotten close again. And so, when the flame is close, uh, it's amazing how fast you'll make sure your invoice and collect on time. Uh, you'll watch the efficiencies. 
is when things go well for a bunch of years and the flame moves away from your rear, you actually slow down on a lot of those things. You actually become, I want to say lazy, but it's not as if it's really close. And so COVID has is, is, been helpful for me. It's brought that flame closer and, and it's important now that I know my numbers more than ever. And so when I started, you know, I had to really uh, make sure that the numbers would make sense because I was a third generation. And if you know all the uh, stats on the first, second, and third generation, you know, the second generation, I think there's a 50% 50, 50 success rate, but a third generation success drops down to less than five. And that was me. I'm, I'm a fifth or third generation business. And so understanding your numbers is critical normally, but now everybody's talking about it like more than ever, right? And so it's understand what the numbers mean, right? And that's the key thing. And there's been a lot of talk with the balance sheet. And for the last five years, I've been developed, I've, I teach a course at Landscape Ontario on just the balance sheet. It's a full day session. Um, and to me, the balance sheet is probably your, your most, not your most important, but that's the, the thermometer. So I've, in, you, in your handouts, I have a, a, a PDF of my presentation, the full day session, but yeah, I have shared the whole PDF with you. In there, it talks about all the ratios you need to be watching for and why there's conflict a lot of times between your accountant and your banker. Your accountant says, uh, take dividends out, don't pay yourself a salary. The banker says, uh, why is there all these dividends out? There's no equity left in your business. And you're saying, well, my accountant said, I don't, I don't want to pay tax. And your banker says, well, there's no money left. And so now I can't give you a loan. And so now as business owner, you're stuck in the middle. You don't know what's going on. And so that's why understand your own numbers. So you become smarter and understand them is critical, even anytime. Uh, and this is where I help my self growth clients as well is, you know, I review their financials every month. I look at them as a, from a CFO perspective, and because I I was in their shoes, I bought a company with no money, so I understand what you know. We have to really uh, watch those details, and that's where you know measuring what you treasure. You know, whatever your treasure, where your heart is, that's what you need to measure. And and this will change. We'll talk about that in a second here. Um, the concept of less is more. Less is more is not just a design uh, concept. It's also in the business. And we always need to be right-sizing. So when businesses grow, you tend to take on more and more of this, more and more of that. And are you making more profit? Not always. Um, but when you have a, a situation like COVID where everything stops dead, uh, then you also realize, like I said earlier, those problem areas. And it's not about just cutting things out. It's about right-sizing. It's knowing what to cut out at what time. The other thing about finance is celebrating the small wins. So for example, this past April, uh, so for Gellerman, our fiscal year started April the 1st. Uh, back in March when I laid everybody off, uh, we, we met with all our vendors and we postponed payments. Uh, and I said my goal at the end of April would be to break even. If we could break even, that'd be fantastic. Well, we saw a 31% drop in sales. And with our wage subsidy from the federal government, we were able to break even. So I was like, okay. This is fantastic. This is a, this is a this is actually not a small win. This is a big win. Uh, my problem sometimes is that I don't like to celebrate things. I like to just move on and go after the next goal. And so in your business, if you're like that, like me, slow down, celebrate that small win, and then move forward. The other thing, when it comes to you know everyday business life, never mean you know never mind after this COVID situation, is that the concept of open book financials. Uh, this concept, uh, I started probably about 10 years ago. And when I mentioned talking to my father-in-law about it, I said, Hank, I'm thinking of uh, sharing the books with my senior team, my managers, my VPs. He goes, you're nuts. He goes, I said, why am I nuts? He goes, well, they, they're going to think you're taking out for themselves. Like, like if you show them what the profit is, like, um, you know, what are they going to think? I'm like, well, Hank, they think that now already. When they see us driving a new truck in the yard, our staff think that, oh, we must be loaded and we just bought a new truck. They have no concept of that, that truck is leased. We need to do X sales to do the work. Uh, they don't understand this. And he thought I was crazy by sharing the financials. Um, I was truly tired of being the only person managing cash flow. I was tired of that. And so today we're at a point where all our managers um, see the numbers right down to the net profit. And guess what? They own their departments. They manage their budgets. They actually operate like a business owner within within their own company. And I don't have to manage cash flow anymore. They're doing it for me. And so 
today, you know, you look forward is use COVID as an excuse to do different things. Use it as a way to move forward in your business, to really push open the, the floodgates and get to that next level. And an open book financial um, uh, understanding or behavior can really help. It's amazing how now my staff are like, no, we don't need to buy that. Uh, and then if you connect your uh, incentive plans, and so I have one incentive plan now for the whole company, and it's based on the great game of business, where we share the open financials. So when we when one wins, we all win together, especially when you have multiple branches, multiple services. We do snow plowing, uh, less construction, maintenance, and each each area has their own profit and loss statement. So we can see which ones are doing, but in the end of the day, we all win together or we all lose together. So creating all individual incentive plans is complicated and creates its own monster. It's just hard to manage. So again, another thing that is critical now more than ever is you have your finger on the pulse. Do you know what the company's health is? And you know, do you really know where you stand uh, or are you running by your cash bank balance? Now, this is a question that, you know, in my consulting world, many of my clients, when I would uh, go into their business, do a deep dive, audit, review, uh, they was, I'm like, okay, um, how do you know where you're standing at any given point? And, you know, they're like, well, I checked the bank balance. I said, so your financial statement. So you use QuickBooks. Yeah, we use QuickBooks. Uh, who prints out, what, what do you print out every month and take a look at that? Well, I look at my sales. It's okay, yeah. Is that cash in the bank? No. All right, and then, so it really comes down to many people are still using their bank balance as their finger in the pulse. But yet we all know that that's, that's not a good good way of doing it. Even when you're small, uh, there's there's a better way and it's, it's to have better accurate financials, but also having a dashboard of what, can you, what should you measure. And so dashboards for me are our KPIs. They're always changing. We're always trying to uh, perfect it, make it better. And that's why there's no perfect one. We keep it simple. We are the green, orange, red light. So this morning in my uh, weekly level 10 meeting with my senior team, we look at you know sales for the month, where are we at, uh, what's in the, in the pipeline, and we use these indicators or these colors to say, if we're at orange or yellow, okay, we need to really look at that. If we're green, we don't talk about it. Move on. Uh, and so here's some for an example, just you know, leads per week. Back in April, the lead per week was zero. Now all of a sudden it jumps up to like 25, uh, which is almost too many now. We can hardly manage that. We look at what dollars in the pipeline, we look at our close ratio, uh, we look at our win values, uh, we want to measure our revenue per hour, but also gross project gross profits. So we do this together because as we've seen just in the last week, uh, some jobs where you're selling just labor, your revenue per hour is actually low because you haven't sold any material or you haven't marked up any subcontractors. So you have to combine that with a project gross profit, or even if you start looking at throughput, that will help as well. And like I said, all these things are things that we need to be doing regardless. But if we want to excel beyond and you haven't started doing this, now is the time to start. Okay. Another thing for uh, here in Ontario, Canada, uh, Google reviews is is what we've been using in our industry to, or our area to uh, from a customer standpoint. Um, client retention rates, we look at staff retention rates, um, we look at number of safety infractions that are being, uh, being noticed and, and being uh, uh, written up, um, sales to budget, net profit budget. As you're seeing, there's all kinds here. You're going to find five for your business that work good uh, and, and you're going to stick to it and then you're going to change it because you have found, hey, that doesn't work so well, let's, let's upgrade it. But as we excel, as we look forward, if you're not measuring anything, how do you know what to focus on? Right, um, you got to whatever you treasure, you got to focus on. But I believe as well as that money flows where focus goes. So if you're going to focus only on sales, you're going to grow your sales. Now, if you grow, your, if you focus on your net profit and, and the efficiencies to get there, then the money will flow there. Um, and so I've seen this for the last 15 years is that it does evolve and change. And it's not like oh we did it wrong before. It just evolves and changes. And so when you think of cash flow, right, for using the bank balance, that's one way. I'm not going to suggest that's the right way. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's you set your plan in place back in January, and now you have to change your plan. So this is where the budget comes in, you know, changing your budget to reflect today's world. In my world, 
uh, losing the month of April was 12.5% of my runaway of getting work in the ground. How do I make up 12.5% on the rest of the remaining seven months? How do I budget for that? And so for us, we had to start start up an, an extra crew because I just didn't have the runway to put that work in the ground. And so, you know, what, what are you doing for your business? And so when you think of cash flow, I'm the kind of guy that I plan for the worst and expect the best. I am not going to say, well, it won't be that bad. COVID is not going to last that long. Uh, we'll be over by June the 1st, early and be fine. Well, thankfully, um, you know, by May the 1st, we were fully, we were back up and running. Um, but it doesn't mean that next October and December uh, that the market might fall, fall out. And so it's about how do you forecast for this, right? So my my line of credit comes due every year at a certain date where they review my financials and either give me the same line of credit or they lessen it or make it greater. So with all that's gone on and all the banks are giving up money and the government's giving up money, I don't think, and I'm not going to plan for that, but we're planning the opposite. So I don't think that my line of credit is going to be, uh, I'm going to be able to give more, get more money unless I can show huge profits between now and the end to when, when my bank, my LOC is going to be renewed. So I'm going to plan for the worst. I'm going to plan that it actually cut it back by a quarter or by a third and then create a cash flow plan that's based on that. It's when people say, no, nope, I'm going to stick my head in the sand. I'm going to get the same amount of money. You don't know. And just because your landscape business is actually doing okay, what's the rest of the world doing? It's not just our little industry here that's going to be affected. The banks are affected by everything. And so it's critical that we don't um, plan for the best, accept the best, expect the best. It's plan for the worst. That's the, to me, that's the only way. And that's not because I'm a pessimistic person. No, I'm a I'm pretty real about how things are. And I'd rather be wrong um, than, uh, you know, I'd rather be wrong in my assumption that it's going to be worse then forecast something fantastic and make the budget look fantastic. And, oh, if we hit this number, we can be cheaper, we can sell more, and then the bottom falls out, and then you, you know, you, you're losing it. So it's important to have those key relationships with your banks, your landlords, uh, your clients, right, suppliers. I've seen some uh, clients of mine that they're able to get paid up front on their contracts. Well, that's pretty good. Um, and so this, this is a spreadsheet here that is in the uh, my 12-month cash flow. Uh, there's some instructions on the first page. It's, it's simple. Um, but it's, it's, it's fantastic, and I use it in my business. I, I, I suggest other people to use it as well. Um, there's different tabs on the bottom where you can enter stuff in, and you can keep an eye on your cash flow a lot closer than ever before. And so that leads me to, I got five pages of these cash flow tips. Uh, and, and uh, you know, again, it's good, good to have this all the time. But it's to know your, the first thing is really know your today's cash, cash position. Right, so money, money in the bank is not going to tell you that because you might have tomorrow that your lease and rent payments come up. Uh, so it's knowing where you sit at any given point, right? So uh, one of the things that we measure here is working capital, is your liquidity, right? It's your assets to buy, your current assets to buy, your current liabilities. Do you have the liquidity to actually make payroll this week, right? And this is where you could have uh, your accounts receivables um, that are maybe 60, 90 days old or old, but is is it can it be converted to cash quickly? Or you've done lots of work, but you're behind your invoicing. That will show up in your working capital right away. Um, so that's the first one. Everybody needs to know what their working capital is. And when you're at one-to-one -one, uh, liquidity, uh, it's like, okay, my current assets equal my current liabilities. Uh, what does that look like? That's one-to-one. -one. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad. Well, that's still kind of tight. And you like to be at 1.5 to one or even two to one. Now, if you're at four to one, that means you have all kinds of cash in the bank. That means that that flame that I talked about earlier, that flame actually is far from your rear because you don't have a cash flow problem. So you actually probably run more methodical. You probably, you may be highly efficient, but then it's like, okay, why is all that cash sitting in your business? What happens if you ever got sued? All that be taken away. You know, that's a whole nother story, another uh, webinar, what to do with cash in your business. But again, now it's about doing bank monthly bank reconciliations and don't buy cash or don't use cash to buy something that's going to depreciate really quick. Now is not, not the time to do that. The other thing is have a cash plan, right? So we know where we sit financially or cash wise. I would project out, and that's that um, spreadsheet that I'm going to share with everybody. List all the transactions in there. Be conservative in forecasting your AR. Just because last year you had you know high level of sales doesn't always mean this year. Um, 
plan out your deferral payments. So in my case here, I was able to defer a lot of my HST, which is my tax, my, my work, workman's comp, and even some vendor payments or leases. We were able to renegotiate our leases, but that defer, those repayments are gonna, so those lease payments in the following months are gonna be higher than before. So I can make sure I'm gonna plan for that. And the other thing I do is I create a vacuum, I create a savings account. So this is a little game that I play with myself in that we have our operating account and then I'll take money out of that and put it away in the savings account in case something happens. So, so in my operating account, there's less cash there that makes me collect my AR faster, makes me invoice faster. So I play a little game with myself. You can play your own game, whatever works. Uh, the third thing is, um, is to update your deposit structure. So if you're an account, if you're in the landscape construction business, is are you the bank for your clients? Now is the time, if you haven't done this yet, is to get more money up front on signing and on the first day than ever before. You do not want too much left over at the end because, well, I think of this, people are home more than now. They're, they're gonna watch you as you're building the landscape. They're gonna be nitpicking you. You wanna get all that money up front as much as possible, right? And then be diligent with your AR collections. Um, I always say, who's the one person's responsible for AR? And somebody says, oh, no, I have this person, that person. So who's who's accountable then? Well, then nobody is, right? So AR, accounts receivable is one of those things that many landscape contractors hate doing. They don't mind invoicing, but collecting on that money is a lot harder. And yet, at the end of the day, cash in the bank is king. Cash is king, right? So it, it's we have to do it. And the thing is, the funny thing is that people expect you to call. Um, you know, squeaky wheel does get the grease in this business, right, of AR. I was, actually, I was born, my father spent all his, he's in the 70s now, he spent his whole career in accounts receivables. So I inherently absorbed some of that. Uh, collecting bad accounts is not hard. You know, I just call and say, hey, it's come to my attention that your account's overdue. Now, the president of the company's calling, come to my attention. They're like, uh, and, you know, you just have to ask for it or say, hey, what's your plan? You know, we've done the work already. Uh, but if you don't ask, they don't give because somebody else is giving, they're giving it to somebody else a lot of times. Number four here is the eliminate the days in invoicing or delays in invoicing, right? So customers want to pay when the project is complete. They just do. Um, so are you invoicing right away or say, oh yeah, I'll get to it on a rainy day. Hmm. Those rainy days don't show up because you've got so much work now you're behind. You're going to start running out of cash faster because your suppliers will send you their invoices on time and they will uh, want to collect their money, and your your staff will want to get paid. And so it's important that we we do get the deposits, the the draws, and we do get those invoices out as fast as we can. On a maintenance contract, you know we invoice the first of the month before this month even starts. Um, when it comes to snow invoices in the, in the winter time, we'll we'll invoice every two weeks, more often, smaller amounts, more often. It, it, especially if we're dealing with corporate companies where they have uh, they cut checks every Friday or every Tuesday. Once a week, you gotta know when are they cutting checks. Um, it's important to know those little things. In other words, you just wait longer. And the last slide on this is just to, to evaluate your customers. I used to say annually, but now it's monthly. Um, really rank your customers based on the gross profit percentages, on payment histories. And now, you know, you can't keep on a poor margin customer. The, the runway is too short. Uh, the margin in the business is not enough. Um, and the last thing is really to raise prices but carefully, right? You say, well, I can't raise any prices. Well, if you haven't done some for a few years, are you going to keep doing, you know, keep operating on the same price or there might be an opportunity here? So that's on the on the financial side of things of excelling. We look at the client side of the selling. You know, this is really where if you're in the service industry, are you offering multi-year contracts? You know, and you offer a three or a five year. You know, so at Geldman here, we offer, you know, one year, but we show a five year too. And it's fantastic when they sign a five-year because we know now that's ours to lose. It's in the system. Uh, we, we have definitely revenue coming in each month. We know what it's going to be. Uh, I talked about the design build. You know, short term, I see a, a, an uptake in, in that side of our business just because everybody's at home. They can't travel. One of our clients said to us this week, uh, usually I spend $25,000 a year on traveling. Well, I can't even leave the country now. So I guess we'll spend that in our backyard. Fantastic. I'm right there for you. Um, looking for recurring revenue streams, building partner relationships with your clients, right? And be engaged, communicate often. Um, I have a slide on that where uh, if, you, if you don't communicate, 
uh, you know, we, we, we used to say no news is good news. I don't believe in that. Uh, no news is actually bad news because they're usually doing something else. Uh, I want to know what's going on. We need to be communicating, right? So communicating, we, we send out daily activity reports. I know LMN has a fantastic uh, platform for that as well. Um, our quality, you know, our field managers, that's a big change we made in our company here. We used to have managers that were driving around checking quality and, and training, um, but we added, actually, we changed it and said, okay, 50 or 60% of your, your time must be working alongside and billable. We did that for the month of April. That was part of the reason why we were actually uh, a break-even month because our managers were, prop, were productive. Um, talk about communication and ready and service. And this is the value, right? So this is where you don't want a discount. You're going to provide extra value now more than ever. You're going to have a sense of community is do not discount your services. So some people have, well, I have to discount because they're putting pressure on me. Yeah, they will put pressure on you, but keep providing value um, so you don't have to worry about that. Oh, here's the slide. Where there's avoiding communication, negativ negativity fills it. And I've, I've seen that, especially this COVID thing, right? If you're the person that uh, is on, um, if you're you know at home and you're not bored, but you're restless and, and you've been on Facebook and all the news things, uh, it's gonna be all negative. It's not gonna be positive stories being on, on the news and stuff. So um, in your own company, be that voice of reason be that beacon of light to your clients as well and give them information um, how you're handling how you're handling everything. All right, so we think about vendors, strategic partnerships are important, having a relation, having a trans, not a transactional, but more relational, so it's win-win, so important. Uh, I'm just gonna speed her up here a little bit. So again, what I said earlier is that we need to be focusing on business owners, your marketing and sales, your production, your efficiencies and client relations. But we all know there's another part of the business that we haven't even talked about yet. We talked about earlier about the cash flow side of things. And so as a business owner, do you know yourself? You know yourself, as Socrates would say it. You understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. Right? When you said you got into business for a reason, why? And now that you're in this now after 5, 10, 15 years, do you still understand your strengths? Because really what's happened is, as a business owner, is you wear a lot of hats. You're the marketing guy, you're the HR guy, you're IT, you're the you're doing the bookkeeping maybe, or maybe your spouses. Uh, you're doing sales, you're doing the operations, you're buying the trucks. It's like all these things are happening all at once. And I'm saying we have to focus and, and the run we got shorter and we have to work harder. Like Nathan, get your head a shake. Uh, you know, how's that gonna happen? And so we're, you know, where are you at that part, right? So I ask these questions are, you're excited with the number of leads and the amount of work you have, you're really excited, but here's the thing, you're frustrated, you don't know where your business is at. You're running your feet off trying to do everything. You're looking to reduce costs. You're tired of managing staff and finding it hard to find good people. It's like, I can't do this anymore. And I'm suggesting there's an out. You have an out that is different. Um, but now more than ever, I think this out is important. And it, it's, it's a concept of outsourcing your back office. It's these functions here that are important, uh, but can be done by somebody else that specializes in it. Right? And so, this is where under the self growth brand, where I would go into a, a, a company and I have a case study. So I'm just gonna talk the case study right away. This is a real company that I worked with a couple of years ago. I still work with them. We're at two and a half million dollars in sales. Uh, they were growing, doing fantastic work. They had a part-time office staff, an accountant, and the spouse was doing the payroll. Sometimes that can work really well, spouses, and other times it's not fun at all. And so this was costing this company around $47,000 a year. They had no profit and loss report because the office staff really didn't know what they were doing when it came to bookkeeping. They were putting stuff in, but it was all a mumble jumble. There was no reporting. They were operating by, blindly. So when I started doing my deep dive in this company and asked them for, hey, uh, can I have a, a P&L for the end of uh, May? Um, do, you, do you actually look at this? And he said, no. So what do you manage? How do you manage your business? By the bank balance. And what's your goal? Well, I want to take it to $5 million. It's like, really? Uh, how do you plan to do this? Well, I just need to add more crews. So you don't even know if you're making or losing money right now. And he had no clue. And he's like, okay, I don't know what to do. And so I said, well, here's what we've offered with Self Southbrook is that under the Southbrook brand, me as a principal consultant, I'm running a landscape business. I understand what the numbers should be. Uh, I um, And then the people that we use are also involved in the landscape world. So um, in this case, this 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 is across the country, and basically 
they outsource everything now. The payroll, we deal with the government, we deal with all the day-to-day -day bookkeeping, all the monthly reporting, and it's costing him half. Plus, he's getting an analysis. So every month we do an analysis on this business. So I look at it from a landscaper's or, or a CFO perspective with the landscape industry. And he's getting far more resources than ever. But he had to give up some things. He had to give up control. And most business owners, oh, giving up control, that's hard. That's really hard. Um, but in his case, it's like, I can focus on project estimating and, and management of the crews, and I can make lots of money that way. It's this back end stuff that I can't stand. Right? And so it, it's in your businesses is that is there, do you have to do everything yourself? Do you have to wear all those hats and do everything sort of half ass as you would say? Or do we outsource some things? Another client I'm working with right now, a lot smaller business, 500,000 in sales. They had no bookkeeper uh, and they had an accountant, but the accountant did his books every quarter. Right? So in our landscape industry, a quarter, that's three months. When you only have four months or in the winter time, by the time you get your results, your winter is over. You can't make any changes. Or in the summertime, same thing, right? So in this case, sure, they weren't paying very much, but they weren't getting anything either. And so his, you know, this company wants to grow as well, doesn't know how to grow. And so we do the, the books now, and it's about $525 a month. And what was beautiful about this case study is that because he was, he didn't have financials, they weren't accurate. Um, he couldn't get any money. And I connected him with a business development bank here in Canada. And because the books were clean now and we're projecting, he was able to get a loan to now catapult himself to the next level. And so when it comes to, you know, post COVID or whatever else, you know, can we, um, you know, what are the benefits of out outsourcing? And the thing with Selfbrook is that we live and breathe your business. So my experience with Gelderman, who, which the company has still run, is that the Southbrook group is in our landscape industry. It's not like we're outsourcing to India and China to some outsourcing company up there. This is totally different than that. This also allows the owner to keep control. There's a cost savings. You have access to expert talent and resources. I have a client right now, they called me uh, yesterday, said we have an harass harassment issue on the HR side. Uh, we don't have a policy, what do we do? So, well, guess what? I have harassment issues too in my own landscape company. How do we, we deal with it? Because we have policies that have the people. And this is where it's really leveraging and great building a, a greater community of better landscape professionals. Right? At the end of the day, um, you're going to increase your employee efficiencies. You as the owner will be focusing on what you love. And when you started your business, go back to that first question again, was it because of the business of the HR and the finance or was it designing and creative beautiful landscapes and maintaining beautiful properties? What was the reason why you started, right? So this this outsourcing reduces stress for you as the owner. And so as I wrap it up here, um, some top tips, you know, become lean, improve your processes, reduce waste, and outsource those non-core tasks. That's what these are. They're non-core. They're important, but they're, they're not the operation of your business. Uh, understand your fixed costs with your variable costs and what can you control. Uh, Marketing is going to be important now, right? Focusing on your brand. And I'm going to say continue to spend back in uh, March. I was knee jerky. I said, stop our spending. I didn't want to spend with, uh, all the money, you know, whatever we had planned to. And then in April, I'm like, uh, let's, let's, let's put it back up to speed. And now in May, I'm like, okay, all of April, we cut our spending out on, on digital and the leads dropped right off. And so it's amazing how, you know, we can be knee, jer knee jerking, cut things out. And then all of a sudden, oh, no, we need to go back to it. Um, so plan it. The other thing is become a destination company, right? Create your company so that everybody is flocking to your business, right? To your company. Uh, be a strong leader. This is hard, um, especially during this time, right? Everybody expects you to be the best of everything. You know, it could be in your home, it could be here at work. And you're just like, oh, I don't know if I can keep up, Nathan. Like, I got to be always so on top of my A game. And I said, yes, you're right. Your team needs you now the most. Um, I saw that for myself. So you're recharging, you know, whatever... Uh, you need to do to recharge, especially on the weekends, is don't ignore that. Otherwise, you will burn out too. And my staff has said to me many times, Nathan, if you burn out, we're no good. We need you as a leader strong. So, you know, I take my I take Friday afternoons off since uh, beginning of April. Every Friday afternoon off, I take off. Um, and involve your staff to help you, right? So if you if you open up yourself and, and not be humble, but just open yourself up uh, and share your struggles a little bit, uh, they want to help you. And, and they want to help the business. 
Uh, sometimes we're, as men especially, uh, we're stoic and we're fearful, we don't show our emotions, and our staff think that we don't care because of that, yet we do. Um, so give a little more of yourself, right? Care personally for your, your staff, right? And they will care back. Um, and the last thing is always be hiring. And now is a fantastic time to hire great people outside the industry because of their traits and bring them back in um, into your industry and train them on what you do. Um, but those hardcore traits that they have, I, I think there's a great opportunity here for people to join great companies. And so that takes me at the end of uh, my session here uh, with um, getting back to the basics. Again, like I said, a lot of these things I'm talking about today are just not for, for now. We should have been doing these five years ago or two years ago or a year ago. You're just good business sense. Um, hopefully, you, you know, me sharing what I've done with my own landscape company resonates with you today. Um, it's not theory or theoretical advice um, that I do with my consulting business. It is tried and true stuff that I'm doing right today. And like I say to everybody, I'm not going to suggest something to you that worked 10 years ago when I don't even use it in my own business. I'm going to suggest stuff to you that I'm using in my business. So that takes me to the end. That was excellent, Nathan. Thank you so much for um, such a power-packed hour. Um, really, really, really um, chock full of, of some great advice. Really liked how you talked about knowing your numbers and then having that open book where you share with, with your crews and, and your employees um, so that everybody's on the on the same page. I'm, I'm sure those discussions are are very galvanizing um, and and you know making sure that uh, when that transparency is there I'm sure it uh, gets everybody you know working towards um, wanting to achieve the, the same goals because uh, uh, everybody knows the reasons why um, those are the goals and uh, let's let's get after them um, there were a couple of comments uh, along the way not so much questions Great case study and uh, regarding the, the the outsourced bookkeeping, um, almost the the perfect scenario right now, uh, Nathan. Which is help me help me grow uh, while saving me money. Um, yeah. Help me grow while saving me money while now giving me an expert that understands how uh, the books um, should look um, with respect to pointing items out um, relating to the green industry, right? So, oh, yeah. um, you know, uh, we, we all know, I'm sure, some, some great accountants, um, but for those who are uh, very, very, very uh, honed in on the green industry, uh, those, those books can tell uh, quite a story. And I'm, I'm sure as a byproduct of your uh, consultation with that organization, you might not have started out with bookkeeping as the initial engagement, but you arrived at that, uh, you know, sort of pinnacle quite uh, quite easily, um, you know, given likely what they were doing, likely the money that they were spending, and you know, probably because they weren't achieving the results from um, maybe the the view to the numbers that uh, that they should have. So, is there anything that you can just add real quickly as we close? on that outsourced piece, because I know there's a lot of owner operators that are thinking about their business going, we don't outsource too much. Um, you know, some of us might not use even subcontractors, but um, bookkeeping specifically is unique. And when you have an eye like you do uh, to understanding the green industry at a deep financial level, there can be a lot of value in that exercise. Well, there's, there's always this constant uh, pressure to lower your overhead and you know there's good overhead and there's bad overhead right there's good stuff you can take on there's and and and, and so knowing what the difference is and the other thing is many so most of my clients that we do the bookkeeping first you're right they were first a coaching client um you know i do a deep dive I review their existing financials both internal and uh accountant generated and there's always a huge difference between what those two look like and so then I asked, so how do you manage your books now? And they're like, we don't. Uh, or we wait to the end of the year and then we see what they can. And I say, and then you, you, go, you go, oh my, I did all that work for that. Or, hey, look at that, we made money. And you don't know how you did that, right? So many times our, our discussions are around, they don't know where they're, 
where they're flying today, or they might even have financials, but they don't read them. They look at their sales, but they don't understand the stuff in between. Now the profit and loss statement, that's pretty easy. Like, that's easier for people. But the balance sheet, it's when they go to the bank for money and the bank says no, or the bank says, uh, you need to do a personal guarantee. And the business owner says, why is that, Nathan? It's like, well, I wouldn't give you money. They're like, what? I have, I have so much work. I'm like, yeah, but your business is worth nothing. And they're like, what? And they have no clue. So when I start talking to them about it, they're like, well, who's, nobody's explained this to me. I said, your accountant is here to save tax. They're to get it right, make sure that it's for CRA or for um, um, whatever in the States it's called. Uh, you know, what your, your government gets the numbers accurately. And your, and your accountant will say, you need to improve your gross profit. But they won't tell you how to improve your gross profit. Or they'll say, yeah, don't pay yourself a salary, pay yourself a dividend because you pay less tax. And they're not wrong. But then when you go to your bank, the bank says, well, we can't give you money. Uh, you have to sign your house on this. And the business owner is, is clearly doesn't understand what's going on. And I, I, I had to teach myself all this stuff because I, I used the bank's money to get me to the, where I wanted to go. I didn't want to put my personal money into the business. I want to leverage our equity, our assets to get to grow our business. So that's when these discussions happen on the coaching side, they're like, well, my bookkeeper doesn't do it. Like, I said, who, who, who tells your bookkeeper to do what? And when you, uh, you know, when you do a landscape job, are you matching revenue with expenses? And they're like, uh, I don't know what you mean. I said, well, you, you get an invoice from your, your bricks, you know, your hardscape company. You, you pay for it in April, but you actually invoice it in May. Yeah. I said, now when you look at your financials for April, what do you tell yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, we have more sales coming next month. So that's why my numbers are not looking good. But then when you get to May, do you tell yourself, Oh, we, reason why we're doing so well because we thought we we didn't our expenses are actually in the pre, in the other month. And they're like, and I said you can't look at both months now are are, are wrong. They're like, well, how do I fix that? I said, well, you have to tell your bookkeeper to make those journal entries and make accruals. And they're like, oh, they don't know how to do that. And that's where it goes. And it's like, okay, time out here. I can take this on. We can out you can outsource it. That you have a new chart of accounts, you know, based on on the LMN list of stuff set up a certain way, we'll make the changes in your QuickBooks, we'll put you online, if you're not online, we'll connect you with LMN, we'll do all these things. And people are like, wow, now I have real numbers. Now you can grow your company. So it, it, it all starts off with, well, I wanna grow my business. And I say, okay, where? And they don't know where, because they don't know where they're profitable. And then you go deeper and deeper, and then it's like, okay, what if you didn't have to worry about that anymore? What if you could just focus on growing your business, doing sales and operations, and you let somebody else do that? And then, and then the HR part comes in too, right? Well, I don't know how, how to hire a salesperson. Well, I do in Gelderman, so here we offer those services too now. All right, so it just, it leads, one thing leads to the next. Right. Yeah, so. that's great, Nathan. Um, and I know you can go all day um, yeah. on, on all of these subjects, but um, just before we close, um, one last slide from LMN really quickly. Um, our virtual workshops, we move those online for greater access. Uh, online Academy um, for us continues to be uh, the number one education uh, tool and resource center at LMN to help all of our clients. Um, enhance customer support, reach us, uh, chat, email, over the phone, our crew of experts ready to, uh, to assist um, uh, each and every day. And then webinars like this, um, again, thank you so much, um, Nathan, for, for your time. Really appreciate you sharing your expertise. We will make sure that everybody has access to the additional resources that you've provided um, as a byproduct of this uh, webinar. And I hope everybody has a really successful uh, summer and look forward to the, the follow-up from Nathan. Reach out if you need uh, practical advice that uh, will make a difference in your business. Thanks again. Thank you, Dave.